So I messed around and turned on that quiet on set last night. Y'all know the documentary of the Nickelodeon kids stars and everything they had to go through to be a Nickelodeon kids star. Well, I also messed around and finished that mug last night. All four episodes. I couldn't turn it off. Without spoiling it, the documentary basically takes us behind the scenes on some of Nickelodeon's biggest shows. It tells a story about how both kids stars and adults experience absolute disrespect on set, extremely uncomfortable and inappropriate behavior, and even S.A. Now, a lot of the show focuses on Dan Schneider, and for obvious reasons, he's the big fish. But the story that stuck out to me the most was that trash bag Brian Peck and what he did to Drake Bell. Now, you can watch the show for details, but let me tell you, it was tough to watch. And the craziest part of it all, after being convicted in 2004, look at this list of credits. This man still got all this work in Hollywood after what he did. Man, that's crazy. Yo, so I just finished watching the quiet on set documentary about Dan Schneider and all the abuse that was going on with child actors um, behind the scenes at Nickelodeon. I am like taken back. I'm gagged because we already kind of knew stuff was going on. But like going into detail with it, having Drake Bell come in and talk to us about like him getting like R worded by one of the producers. Dan Schneider's like abuse and like all the in sexual innuendos like in all the shows and just everything that they pulled out is just so insane like it was so insane if you haven't watched it like you need to find a way to watch it I really think that it shouldn't be looked at as something that only happened back then this stuff is probably still happening right now with child actors right now and there needs to be more protection like everyone I want I want everybody jailed Every single person involved. Everybody jailed. Everyone. Y'all watch it. The black mama did what the fuck she's supposed to do. Did what the, you, you could tell that her son wasn't going to R. Kelly house or Michael Jackson house or whoever house. Yeah, he wasn't going. And he ain't go to Diddy house. I'm telling you that right now. And uh, I'm not even trying to be funny because, uh, listen, they said she was the, the problematic mama because she kept talking. And they was basically the agent calling her, telling her, like, you know, can you chill out, do it for your son, this, this, that, and the third. She said, things are weird. And yes, ma'am, they were very strange at Nickelodeon. It was very strange at Paramount Pictures. I'm, I'm concerned. And then he only got 16 months for touching on that boy, and you admitted it? And then you turn around and you get hired at Disney? Oh, my gosh. If you have not seen Quiet on the Set yet, you have to watch it. My kids were 90s kids they are all pretty much grown and adults now i've got a couple left but uh wow 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 as a mom i'm shook i i don't i don't even know what to say it's just absolutely ridiculous the things that these kids did and as parents why didn't i, I mean as a parent why didn't i say anything i guess i was just dumb and naive and I'm like hey it's kids and there's no way they're thinking of it that way I I feel like a terrible parent to be completely honest Gen Z and every generation that comes after them are more exposed to the truth than any millennial ex or anybody ever was past couple of years has been crazy where you know all the things that I feel like make that makes up the millennial identity is being like exposed and ripped to shred like our heroes have been abused our shows had this underlying theme of misogyny racism they're pedos like like the fantasy was like all a lie gone gone quiet behind set was so eye-opening of all the messed up stuff that was happening right in front of our faces this is truly an era of uh, of awakening and every generation that is seeing this are really seeing the world for what it is. We were completely blindsided by the the glitz and the glamour. Like, I mean, Nickelodeon, dude, that, that was that was kid culture. Like, and I always felt proud that we had like a real kid-like culture for like the t the, the tweens and the teens. At that time, we had a place that we could gather and not have to deal with like all the like what the adults were doing. And it's really hard to distract kids nowadays when they're literally exposed to all this information in seconds. 
So when people keep talking about like, oh man, I'm so afraid of this generation, like they're not ready, blah, 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 blah. I'm just like, don't count them out just yet. We can't judge an entire generation based on who they are as teenagers in their early 20s. There is still an insane amount of potential when it comes to them. And they can sense the bullshit right away. And we are just now being exposed to all the bullshit. I just finished watching Quiet on the Set, the dark side of children's television. And my only question is, why are these shows still on TV? R. Kelly have allegations, we take his music off the radio. Bill Cosby has allegations, we take his shows off the network. Why is this? Jonathan Majors had allegations and wasn't even convicted of them yet. And they wrote him out of a movie that they wrote for him to play the role in. Why are Dan Snyder's shows still on TV? Any adult that has eyes could look at these shows and tell that they were not made for children. And I found it mighty ironic and convenient that the only child stars that didn't have anything to say about what happened to them were the ones who are still in Hollywood and still working on TV currently. Hey everyone, it's me. Welcome back to my channel. I'm back in another video. Man, I have not filmed a video in so long. It may or may not feel like it because there's certain videos that like I film in advance just to try to keep the, the pacing of the videos. But I haven't been posting and filming as much as I would like because life has just been lifing. Work has gotten really, really intense. And so I just haven't had much time to myself, to be honest. I'm literally coming off of a weekend where I worked the entire weekend. I literally haven't had a break since like last saturday so not the saturday that just passed but the saturday before that one that was the last time i had like a full like day <laughs> to myself which i know is not good and it's not healthy but you know work has just picked up a lot and i've been trying to keep up with that and then any little time that i have to myself i literally just I try to reserve it for myself. And so I just haven't had much time to film and record, but I really wanted to talk about this documentary that everyone has been talking about. Quiet on set, you know, everyone has been talking about it and sharing their thoughts. Honestly, I, I thought about, cause I, I asked you guys in a community post if you guys wouldn't mind me making TikTok compilations about certain topics while I'm in the midst of trying to get my posting schedule together, just so you guys can still have consistent content on the channel even if I'm not necessarily a part of it. And a lot of you guys said that you would be cool with that. But I felt like this particular documentary, I needed to give my personal thoughts about it. I didn't want to just throw a bunch of TikToks up there of people discussing the topic. I, I also wanted to add, you know, my thoughts and my opinions um, on this documentary. And so I'm basically going to be going into some of the highlights of the documentary. I'm not going to be breaking it, you know, down piece by piece because I literally will be sitting here for two hours. And to be completely honest with you, I don't know if I have two hours to dedicate to filming a video. So I'm just going to be hitting a lot of the main points of the documentary, as well as discussing just how people have responded to the documentary, how people are viewing, you know, the victims that may have been in these situations, and also some of the not so great responses. I'm going to be getting into all that in this video. So let's get into this documentary. Oh, actually, before I get into the documentary, I actually had a quick question um, that I wanted to ask you guys, for those of y'all who watch my videos on a more frequent basis basis again if you don't care <laughs> about um the question that i'm about to ask feel free to just hop skip to to the actual topic i'll make sure that i have that um segmented out for you if you want to skip this part but i i did want to ask you guys and kind of get an idea of how the channel should be formatted you know i feel like me not only giving my personal opinion on a topic but also bringing in other perspectives to the conversation i feel like has been the most ideal for my channel in terms of content i enjoy hearing other people's opinions about certain topics even if it's not an opinion that i agree with but i didn't want to get your guys thoughts about you know do you guys enjoy watching the tiktoks you know both in the beginning of the videos and throughout the videos would you prefer if i just put the tiktoks at the beginning and then the rest of the video is just me talking let me know your thoughts in the comments down below about just your thoughts on the format i have gotten a few comments here and there none of them have really 
really been constructive. They've kind of just been mean and nasty about, you know, either me including too many TikToks or me not including enough TikToks or, you know, saying I'm talking too much even though it's literally my channel. Um, So I just wanted to get your guys' overall thoughts about, you know, this format. Like, do you guys like the format? Do you guys like when I include TikToks? Do you feel like I should include less TikToks instead of the video? Let me know your thoughts in the comments about that. Now we can get into the documentary. Now the documentary, Quiet On Set, you know, it was about basically Nickelodeon, right? It was all about Nickelodeon and how just a lot of child stars were not protected back in the early 90s and 2000s. It talked about Dan Schneider a lot. It talked about uh, Brian Peck and other just creepy predator type of people. And, you know, the documentary was really eye-opening and some of the things that were talked about in the documentary I already knew and I was already familiar with especially with the whole Dan Schneider stuff I've actually been following that stuff for a couple of years now there's actually quite a few videos on YouTube that have literally done a deep dive into Dan Schneider and what he put his co-workers through what he put a lot of the child actors through just a, a lot of his creepy and predatory ways so I already knew that Dan Schneider was not a good person and I've, I've known that for a few years now and even a lot of the the clips that they showed in the documentary and the clips that are showing up on social media you know seeing some of the scenes from you know either all that a lot of clips from Victorious specifically and you know a lot of the clips of Ariana Grande when she made content for the slap a lot of the inappropriate stuff they had her do I was already familiar with a lot of that stuff and just again all the inappropriateness that would happen on these sets and in the scripts and that that, you know they made people do I was already really familiar with that what I was not familiar with was all the stuff with Brian Peck the stuff with you know all the other predators that had been you know arrested and convicted that worked at Nickelodeon not to mention too that Brian Peck was hired at Disney and worked on the Sweet Life of Zack and Cody like this entire documentary was very eye-opening and again I've known for a while that a lot of these people that work behind the scenes not only just with these kids shows but just in entertainment in general it's just there's a lot of sickos out there in the entertainment industry and I feel like more and more we're seeing it being uncovered and revealed in the public eye and I think I might have said this in a video or two ago that it feels like 2024 is the year of people being exposed for who they really truly are people are literally you know they're they're showing their true colors or they're being called out for their behavior and people are seeing that a lot of their favorite celebrities favorite shows favorite whatever like people are not who they portray to be and a lot of the content that we grew up watching there was a lot of the just nasty stuff that's, that was happening behind the scenes I mean even for me like I can't watch the Cosby show anymore it, it's uncomfortable for me to watch the Cosby so show and I can't listen to certain artists music you know I talked about that like there's certain musical artists that I can no longer listen to their music R. Kelly being you know one of them like I just knowing what these people were doing behind the scenes it just it's hard for me to separate what happened to these people or what certain people did to others and still consume their art and enjoy it it's, it's really hard for me and you know as someone that heavily grew up off of Nickelodeon and Disney it's really hard to see that a lot of my favorite core shows you know involved a lot of just inappropriateness and nastiness behind the scenes that they had to go through um you know Demi Lovato has talked about how she was under the influence when she was filming Camp Rock I hide it to where I would sneak drugs I couldn't go without probably like 30 minutes to an hour without um cocaine and I'd bring it on airplanes how um I would just I don't know I would smuggle it basically and um just wait till everyone in first class went to sleep and I would just do it right there or I'd sneak to the bathroom and I'd do it. There's just, there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack with child stars, child actors. And, you know, a lot of that was covered in this documentary. Now, one thing I did want to quickly mention is the, the two writers that had to split their salaries. First of all, that is just, just despicable. Um, the fact that they had two women splitting a salary for as long as they did, it's just ridiculous. And, you know, I hate when people say stuff like, you know, whenever people come out and they talk about how they were 
were they were underpaid for a service and it's within the entertainment industry we see it all the time even with musical artists like you'll see people who are like hey i've written for so-and-so but i got pennies in return you have a lot of people online that'll say like oh we should have negotiated for a better deal and you should have did x y and z first of all y'all don't understand uh, actually let's let's start with that a lot of people they don't even know what they would do in that situation if you, if you had the opportunity to work for a very large uh corporation or person in the industry that you want to work in a lot of y'all would take deals that probably were not favorable that didn't pay well, well for the sake of trying to get in the door and potentially get a better opportunity but it doesn't and the thing is it's not it's not a legal thing well come to find out it was a legal thing like legally he wasn't supposed to be giving them those two women you know half of one salary but just in general people often say like oh well they're not breaking the law they're not doing anything wrong they agreed to what they agreed to but that doesn't make it right and i think we have to stop overlooking ethics for what's legal sure legally people get away with a lot right people get away with a lot i mean we see we have what's happening with the with the boeing airplanes falling out the sky people they learn how to cut costs and cut corners and and do people dirty and you know they they find legal ways of doing that but that doesn't make it okay it doesn't make it okay to take advantage of other people and that's what dan did with these writers that's what the network did with these writers they took advantage of them and they were not paying them what they should have been paid and i just think that that was just so ridiculous i truly feel like this documentary is truly confirming everything that jeanette mccurdy has said in her memoir i'm glad my mom died about nickelodeon this documentary really truly does paint the picture for you how dan snyder really views women that are of age because if you're not of age then you're worshipped like you mean to tell me two of the Amanda Show female writers that got you to where you're at because they're so talented and they play a huge role in your success, they were splitting their salary because they were women. And once they found out like, hey, that's actually like breaking like rules. Like we're supposed to have our own salaries. And the moment that that got addressed, he starts threatening them saying, if you're coming for me, then I'm gonna make sure you never work for me ever again. Like. Meanwhile, if it was a man with no credentials at that, it's not a problem. Money's not a problem. Well, yeah, speaking of the two female Amanda Show writers, Christy was fired after season one and Jenny quit after four days of season two because Dan asked her a very inappropriate question. You can see. Mm. I would truly never be able to wrap my head around anyone who's ever able to defend this man whatsoever. Go on to hell in a handbasket. I also, I also want to dive into Dan Schneider right now. Again, I've known about a lot of, you know, Dan Schneider's weird ways. I've seen the pictures. I've seen the clips. I've heard the rumors. And so him being a creep wasn't surprising to me. But there were a few things that I was like, I did not know about that. One being the massages. That was very weird. Again, I'm not shocked given the type of person that he was. But that also was very weird. And just how Dan was on this power trip. And I think people have gotten it confused. Dan hasn't been accused of being like he hasn't been accused of like preying on a kid or like in a in an inappropriate way. It's not so much that. It's more so his abuse of power and him creating toxic and uncomfortable work environments for people. That he created environments to where if someone was uncomfortable with something or they didn't agree with something, they weren't allowed to speak up. You know, he he preyed on people that, you know, wouldn't stand up to him and wouldn't fight back to him and that in itself as i think was the main focus you know with this documentary it's just dan schneider was just as that lady said in the documentary it felt like you were in an abusive relationship and then not to mention too that he was very inappropriate with his co-workers as well he was very inappropriate and i just i could not imagine and just even as i'm watching the documentary i'm like here i am i'm like i don't know six seven years old watching nickelodeon and enjoying all these shows having no idea what people were going through to you know to give us this content in these shows it's just it's just really really sad um and yes i've seen the interview with uh dan schneider and tebow from from iCarly. first of all how random <laughs> how 
of random that he got Tebow from iCarly to interview him, someone that was a former employee by him. It was giving staged. It was giving, you know, he was being used. You could definitely tell that this was like a marketing ploy. I don't know. Or a PR ploy, I should say. You could tell that, you know, I don't I don't know if it was rehearsed or not, but it definitely felt very like Dan knew the questions that he was about to be asking. It was it was very just it felt very inauthentic to me to be completely honest with you and I'm also shocked that he even said anything because like I said these allegations have been out about Dan Schneider for years and so the fact that he decided with this documentary to say something it does beg the question is Dan still trying to get back into the entertainment industry because like at this point your image is is done it's tainted it's been tainted for a while why are you even trying to clear anything up that's why I feel like it's not with any good intention I feel like he's trying to somehow make his way back into television and he felt like he had to try to like you know clean this up so he could like maybe somehow get back into the industry but I just don't see how that could even happen at this point there's just there's too much that's been said and yes you have a select few individuals that haven't had bad experiences with them but that does not negate all of the people that have these true and authentic stories again yeah we sure we don't we don't know for sure if everybody on that documentary was telling the truth but I think it's safe to say that they were I think it's safe to say that it was coming from a place of being genuine especially considering the fact that they're all pretty much are taking the risk of sacrificing their careers to talk about this to talk about the fact that Dan was not a good person and that they you know were under under these horrible work conditions and they witnessed a lot of just horrible things and uncomfortable things happening on those sets. Now let me say this, while I do understand that everybody deserves a chance to tell their side of the story, after watching a four-part documentary about how terrible somebody is, the last thing I want to see or hear from is Nickelodeon's baked potato. This whole thing felt like a skit from all that featuring special guest 2 chains. And then where the hell did TiVo come from looking like an elbow? This was all I could think about the whole interview because he's never had a serious bone in his body. So all of a sudden, because he's coming out the time machine, we supposed to take him serious? No. This man is known for putting tacos and pickles and bagels on the stick. And now y'all want to put him in a sticky situation? Boo, tomato, tomato. It was giving damage control. It was giving friend, help me please. At least bring somebody to the podium, not from Nickelodeon. Oh baby, this how you know it's bad. You had to do damage control. But your biggest mistake may have been using this to control your damage. Tebow? Tebow, you an op, babe? Because the goal was to, now I know you're, you're targeting trying to convince us who watch these shows. Because I'm nosy. So I had to go see, does he, is he a reporter? Like, since when do he do stuff? Baby, no, he's just an actor. And he's still just most known for his role on iCarly. First of all, the pacing of this interview, it gave very skit. It gave very, I have these questions. I know exactly what I'm going to say in response. You tried to do a good PR move though. It was the apologize without taking accountability for any criminal actions. Just only take accountability for emotional actions, which are things that you cannot be held accountable for. You also tried to put a call to action at the end and make it seem like, oh, we need change in the industry and da da da. Why you wasn't trying to change it when you was doing it? I have a feeling this is not going to save you. Lock that man up now. And so I also, you know, I want to get into the actual people that did prey on children, that did inappropriate things with children and got convicted for doing things with children. The things that were revealed in that documentary because I also get that because they showed some of the documents from some of these court cases and although they they didn't read everything I did read um a lot of what was on the screen and I literally wanted to vomit I literally wanted to vomit obviously a lot of it I can't repeat on camera um if you haven't for whatever reason um if you're watching this video and you have not seen the documentary I highly recommend that you go see it for yourself granted it's not a it's not an easy documentary to get through I, I will admit there were times where I literally had to like look away because it was like it was too much but it, it, again it was very eye-opening and again it's just the, the thought that these people were even able to get onto these sets 
that they were even hired to be around children is just actually insanity to me. And, you know, obviously the, the big reveal that a lot of people have been talking about is Drake Bell, right? It was revealed that, you know, there was a case against uh, Brian Peck where he was convicted of doing inappropriate acts with a minor. And again, I didn't know about any of this. I think I was I was too young because um, I want to say this was around like what, 2003, 2002. I was literally like three years old around the time that this happened. So I had no recollection of this at all. Who's to say if I was even watching Nickelodeon at this time I might have been but yeah so that case was it, it involved Drake Bell right and no one knew that until this documentary and you know it, it brought about a lot of different conversations surrounding Drake Bell because Drake has also had his own stuff right Drake has not been a perfect person but as we learned through this documentary Drake has been through a lot of traumatizing things that can cause someone to spiral and, and go the wrong direction right you know it, it brought about a lot of conversations about abuse and the cycles of abuse because you know it's come out that Drake also had an incident with a minor now there's been a lot of conflicting reports about what exactly happened so I'm not even 100% sure as to what happened. There's a story that Drake willingly was in communication with a minor, inappropriate communication with a minor and I believe that person like the the minor in question has also doubled down and said like yeah like he knew like don't make him out to be the victim and like he didn't know like he definitely knew but then it's also coming out that or I also saw somewhere that Drake was never actually connected convicted of doing anything with her and that it had came out that he did not know her age and that when he found out about her age he cut off all communication I've literally have seen articles and reports on saying both of those things so I don't even know what's entirely true to be completely honest with you a lot of the news that you've been hearing well, most of the news that you've uh, heard recently is entirely false and wrong and I, uh, I feel that you deserve and I owe you an explanation I didn't change my name, um, although I love and would love to. Um, I've never moved to Mexico. I, I've never been a resident or a citizen of Mexico. I don't have a Mexican passport. Um, I didn't get arrested. I didn't go to jail. Um, I know that this has moved very quickly for you, but for, for me, it's been a three year thorough investigation into um, every false claim that, that has been made and, and it's not me telling you that the claims are false but the state of Ohio has proven uh, the claims to be false if these claims were remotely true my situation would be very different I would not be here at home with my wife and uh, and my son um, but that being said I'm I'm not perfect and I, I make made mistakes I, I responded to a fan whose age I didn't know um, yet when I became aware of their age uh, you know, all conversation and communication stopped. Um, and this individual continued to come to shows and pay for meet and greets and all while I was unaware that this was the same person I was communicating with online. Um, and, uh, and that's what I pled guilty to. You know, I, it was reckless and irresponsible text messages. I, uh, there was, I, I wanna make clear that there were no sexual images um, nothing physical between me and this individual. I was not charged with anything physical. Physical. Um, I was not charged with uh, disseminating of photographs or images or anything like that. Uh, this is strictly over text messages. And when I was uh, presented with a plea deal um, because of the messages, uh, I felt that it was the best way to uh, get this over quickly and for everybody to involve to uh, be able to move on and for me to get back to doing what I love and uh, that's making music for you and uh, I want to thank you for um, you know to everyone who who saw through the lies and and did their research and looked at my case and and uh, saw for what it was instead of uh, through all of this media confusion um, and and you know don't don't believe the media right off the bat you know it's a lot of clickbait um, do your own research and uh, and um, come to your own conclusions and uh, I just want to say thank you to all of you I want to for, for sticking by me and I love you and I will, uh, I will see you soon there's a conversation to be had in the event that he did do it right so let so let's go with the theory that he did involve himself with a minor 
willingly, right? A lot of people were conflicted um, that people were conflicted on whether or not to feel bad for Drake, given that he could have potentially did this to someone else, allegedly. And it was that whole thing of, do we still show him grace for what he's been through, even though he potentially did it to somebody else, right? And I think both of those things can exist. I think that you can acknowledge and hold space for his trauma and what he went through as a child while also acknowledging that he continued allegedly continued the abuse to another person and it sparks a it sparks a, a larger conversation about how people that are abused will continue the cycle of abuse onto other people again r kelly not to compare r kelly to drake bell but in the sense of like you know with r kelly it came out that he was abused and taken advantage of when he was younger and so here he is now taking advantage of younger women you know it's it's that cycle of abuse and it is up to that person who was abused to heal and to stop the cycle of abuse but some people you know fall short of that and some people will end up you know continuing that and i know that at one point too like he had fled to another country when all that stuff was going on so there's, there's, a, there's a lot that is going on with with drake and i do i am curious if he is going to address any of that address any of the allegations address what he may have potentially have done Because I think it's a, it's a really important conversation to have. And, you know, I do see that with this documentary, it could potentially help to, like, clean up his image. But I still want there to be some level of accountability if he did indeed do something similar to um, what had happened to him. Even if he didn't necessarily go all the way and it wasn't as disgusting as what happened to him. If there was any inappropriate behavior with a minor, I do think that he needs to acknowledge that. And that needs to be talked about as as well but again i've seen stories on on both sides i, I honestly don't know 100 percent what's true i've literally seen so many conflicting reports about what happened and what didn't happen um uh, but i do still feel for him in what he went through and to know that he was going through that at the height of his career and just in general like i feel like a, there's a lot of child stars that are sexualized really early on and again in their stardom in their careers and you know it's just it's just really weird because they're they're children at the end of the day i mean yes of course like you know you have teenage girls that are boy crazy and you know have them you know on their walls and like posters and things like that i understand that 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 happens but they're still humans and they're still children and i don't think that the industry itself should feed into that you know like he really huh, i just I, I couldn't imagine i just could not imagine and then having to hold that in for as long as he did i just i, I can't imagine and that also brings up the question too right about whether or not child actors should even exist i've seen this conversation circle around a lot and i'm conflicted about it i really am because it also brings about that question of like oh what if a child like just genuinely wants to act and, and wants to get into the industry but then it also brings about the question of well how did how did that interest even come about you know is it just as simple as a kid wants to play pretend they want to pretend to be some Somebody else they don't have to necessarily you know go into the industry to do that you know are there safer spaces for children to act and play pretend without having to go through a lot of what these child actors go through and you know i i definitely see why people are questioning if child actors should even be a thing i definitely think there should be a pause on it and there should be some sort of just restructuring right of of that industry for children in particular you know i've seen people say like there needs to be therapists on set there needs to be way more protocols to make sure that these children you know are safe and they're always in the presence of a trusted adult but again it's like who can you trust on these sets anymore you know like there's just so many bad apples out there you just you never you never know right and so there's definitely some changes changes that need to be made and i don't know what type of changes have been made from all the way back in the early 2000s so now of course nickelodeon has put out their pr statement of like oh like things have changed like you know we we take every single complaint seriously what whatever they whatever 
they mustered up at the last minute and, and, and posted. But yeah, I don't know. There definitely needs to be a change and a shift and there needs to be more protection over child actors and actresses. Like I said, because I've never had, you know, a desire to, to be in that industry, I don't know if I can speak to whether or not that's like a true passion that um that children have per se if they even know what that looks like or what that even entails and if that's something that they really want to do or is it more so that they just want to like you know play pretend and act you know like pretend to be somebody else like I, I don't know um what that looks like but then the other question too is okay if we were to ban children from acting what would children's uh programming look like you know would it be more animation would it be more of okay you're hiring on people who are 18 plus but they still look childlike but then at the same time that means that you can't have shows where you have like you know elementary school kids because there's no 18 year old out there that looks like they're in elementary school i mean i joke all the time that people say i look 12 <laughs> but it, you know in being serious though like what does children's programming look like outside of just animated films and tv shows what does that look like for children if you remove children from children's programming can you even do children's programming with just adults i guess of course you have like sesame street and barney and you know a lot of the shows that i grew up on um the wiggles imagination movers there was quite a few uh child friendly shows that i enjoyed as a kid that had nothing but adults on set and so it's definitely possible i just think that it would look different and and I just, I, I do wonder too, do kids still need children's programming where they're seeing kids their age, you know? Cause a lot of the shows that I grew up watching, a lot of the kids that were on those shows were my age. And, you know, I would often, not necessarily relate to what I saw on TV, but you know, like when I was in middle school, when I watched like Ned's The Classified, right? Which we'll get into them later. You know, I will be like, okay, so this is what middle school was like. You know, I should be, you know, doing the things that they do. Like I, I guess in a way I looked up to and I was inspired by watching people my age and like how they acted and how they dressed and how you know like there was a lot of uh influence there and just I I found myself enjoying shows more where I saw people that were my age that I could relate to in some way or at least I felt like I could again in my kid brain right but what what would that look like if it was just adults making kids content I'm, I'm not sure what that looks like Look, it's super hard when you're a brand new actor and you have to take work for free and you have to submit yourself on a lot of sites and I totally get that and I am not the right person for a lot of those people because I was a casting director so I never had to go through that exact hustle. But I am overly sensitive when it comes to kids and teens because I've seen a lot from the casting director side when it comes to kids. Parents forcing their kids to be actors when they don't want to be. And I think that in general, kids and teens are taken advantage of, of, but in this industry, kids and teens can be taken advantage of. And I think that a lot of times, kids and teens don't necessarily have the bandwidth to understand what this industry is. Adults don't have the bandwidth to understand this industry. So while adult actors will have to deal with the lack of protection that comes with self-submission and that is not okay, I don't think kids should have to. And that's why this advice was dangerous. And that's why this app is dangerous. This is where new kid actors look for advice. And I just want everyone to be safe. Daniel Radcliffe is without question the most successful child actor of all time, but he said he won't let his kids pursue acting. And Daniel Radcliffe started the Harry Potter franchise when he was 12 years old, and when it ended at age 22, he made 95 million. And Daniel Radcliffe said he loved being Harry Potter, saying him and everyone in the cast benefited from doing the movies. But he said having grown up in the industry, he believes the Harry Potter cast are in the minority. With examples like Alison Stoner, who worked 100 hour weeks when she was 12 years old. Macaulay Culkin, who had to be emancipated at age 15 because his parents stole all of his money. Jane McCurdy, who was one of many actresses to develop anorexia from the pressure of acting. So Danny Radcliffe said if he were to have kids and were to push them into acting, he'd be risking their life for money that they do not need. But at the same time, Daniel Radcliffe still loves the movie industry and loved to teach it to his kids. Where he said he'd love to have children and then take them to a movie set and show them how a movie is made. And he said what he'd hope is they'd want to work in something like costume design or special effects and not want to be an actor. Saying he believes movies are amazing art, but there's so much more to it besides being famous and he'd like his kids to know that. But he still said he doesn't think he's ready for children anytime soon. With that, I'm Charles Perl. I hope you learned something. But yeah, since I, I quickly mentioned it, let, let's get right into how some people have responded and reacted to the documentary. Most people who, you know, have a sense of, of empathy and compassion and a heart, you know, felt for these victims 
and were calling for changes to be made, right? However, you had a few bad apples who were not as empathetic to the victims and what people had went through. As I mentioned earlier, the, the Neds Declassified crew just completely missed the mark on their response to this whole documentary. So for those of y'all who didn't see the Neds Declassified crew, so they actually have a podcast where they cover their show. I'm trying to <laughs> I'm trying to decide how much of my personal opinion I want to say on this video, um, but I'll, I'll try to keep it at a minimum. But basically they have a podcast where they, they talk about the old Neds Declassified episodes and they were on TikTok Live and their audience was asking them about the documentary documentary because I think at this point I think either chapter chapter episode two or episode three had just released and they wanted to get their thoughts on the documentary they were making some pretty disgusting ill-timed jokes in reference to the documentary if I can find the clip still I'll, I'll show it Coming. Daniel we told you never to speak about that get back in your hole Daniel and give me your holes. Sorry, we shouldn't joke about this. We really shouldn't. This is awful. Why are we doing this? Because this is about us. Listen, our set was not like that. Um, uh, and no, it's fucking awful. The, the, the Drake Bell shit is a, like, that's crazy to hear. I, I, that is fucked, man. And that never came out, which is really wild. Really wild. I'll tell you who was talking about it. Boop. Boop. Ah. Uh. Okay. Oh, so y'all were in on it. Oh, God. Damn. Wow. I'm not talking about this anymore. No. no. Not no, talking no, about no, this no, anymore. No, no, no. Guys, we can't joke like this. Jesus. Guys, we're, we're, we're sometimes humor helps us move through things, yeah, you know? Yeah, 100%. We need Missy on the pod. But yeah, it was just really just like, why? Like, why would you even make any type of joke as people are asking you about this documentary? Even if you hadn't watched the documentary yet, you can assume that it's about something very serious and it's about child actors. And so why would you even try to toe that line? Even if this is how y'all normally speak or whatever, whatever, it still was just like, why did you think that that was okay? And yes, since that clip, they have come out and, you know, apologized. They literally did an entire episode on their podcast where they dive deep into, you know, the, the documentary. Devin Werkheiser, he, you know, apologized for his comments and he explained that his joke wasn't necessarily about the documentary specifically and that he hadn't seen the documentary yet. But again, it's like, I'm sure you caught wind of what the documentary was about. There's no way that you saw quiet on set and you thought it was going to be like a positive thing. Um, but anyway he says that he didn't watch the documentary and now watching the documentary he can see why people were upset even Drake Bell called him out and you know called him you know Ned's the classless like he everybody was very upset with how they responded to that whole thing and so you know they they apologized and tried to clear it up and so it is what it is but then you also had um I believe it was Kyle Kyle and Chris Massey's mom who also came out and said that she had no issues with Dan and that she's grateful for the opportunities that Dan gave her kids and she did a lot of blaming um on the parents right she said that you know it's the parents fault that this happened not Dan's and again it's like why are we trying to remove responsibility from the person that is in charge for you to sit there and blame these parents who again a lot of them may have not even known what was happening and if they did they were just in such a desperate situation because again a lot of these kids too they were the main breadwinners for their families and so a lot of people again were scared or afraid to speak up because they're like well you know we need this opportunity like you're, you're paying our bills so I kind of have to just let it rock like there's just there was a lot going on and yes some parents could do a better job at protecting their kids you know a lot of parents out there not a lot let me not say a lot there's a few parents out there who don't have good intentions you know for their child Jeanette McCurdy is you know one of them she came up with the whole memoir about how her mother was toxic and how she kind of forced her into the industry so you definitely have those parents out there who didn't do good behind their kids but a lot of them did and a lot of them again Drake Bell's father was an example of that he fought to try and keep Drake safe and something you know still happened to him it's not always that the parents didn't care or they didn't step in and to blame the parents and to and that's the other thing too to try to invalidate someone else's experience just because you had a good experience with them is fucked up and that's you shouldn't do that and I, I hate every single time when you have victims of abuse 
and just whatever the case, you always have those people who are on the abuser side who's always like, oh, well, I've known them for X amount of years and I've never known for them to be abusive and I've never known for them to be this way. Just because you had a good experience with them does not mean that they are like that with everybody else. And to try and invalidate a victim's experience just because your experience wasn't like that, that's not okay. Now, if you just want to speak generally, like if someone were to ask you, hey, what was your experience with Dan Schneider? Sure, answer the question truthfully. But don't sit there and try to take away from what other people went through just because you may not have had the same experience that other people have had. Not to mention the fact that Truth be told, your sons are not perfect angels either. They've also been in their own mess and, and drama and, and things like that. And so, yeah, let's let's not let's not do that. I just uh, but like I said, I, I think for the most part, most people are on the side of these victims and these child actors. There's a lot of conversations about how many other child actors have gone through things and they're silent about it, which I want to get into that as well. People trying to dictate when a victim should speak out and how soon they should speak out. I hate that too. I hate that when people finally find it in themselves to to speak out, that people want to criticize them for speaking out. People want to criticize them and say, oh, why did it take you so long? You cannot tell somebody how quickly to get over their trauma. Like, who are you to tell somebody when they should feel comfortable coming out about something that, that happened to them that was horrific? I mean, again, even with Drake, what what with what Drake went through, I can see why it took him this long to speak up. Like, can you imagine? Especially if you're speaking up against somebody that has a lot of power as well. Like, that's a very scary thing to be in. And a lot of times people don't believe victims. They don't believe victims. If you're if the victim is someone of, you know, less uh stature or notoriety to the person that abused them, a lot of times people don't believe them. They just feel like, oh, you're just trying to take take them down and you're trying to get their money. And it's like, no, they've actually been through something horrific victims go through a lot when it comes to trauma and just everything they have to go through and a lot of times they're going through that in silence by themselves a lot of people don't even tell their families what they've been through and so yeah I really don't like that you like you cannot tell somebody how quickly they need to heal from trauma and having PTSD from something that that they went through and I honestly feel like people who do that haven't gone through anything traumatic themselves I I genuinely believe that there's no way that you that you yourself have been through something traumatizing like abuse any sort of abuse and you're sitting here telling somebody that they need to hurry up and say something or they should have said something when it happened what you're like when it happens to you you're trying to even process that it happened and that in itself could be a very long process it's trying to heal trying to accept what happened trying not to blame yourself for what happened like you know what i mean as someone that has gone through you know my own personal trauma with people like it's a process like it takes a long time time to to get through a lot of that and to have to speak out in public and address it in public it's it's a lot and so I I don't believe in rushing people to speak about things that they went through like I'm, I'm sorry like that's just that's not it but yeah overall um you know, I I admire the people in this documentary that came forward and, and spoke out about what they went through. I think this documentary was so important and so needed. And also I saw on TikTok today that apparently the documentary isn't over. Apparently there's an episode five that's dropping in April. So we there might be more episodes to come. Um, but they kind of ended it like it was it was over with. But I'm not entirely sure. That might have just been like a fluke or something. But yeah, th- I think this documentary was needed. I think it's gonna start a lot of important conversations in that industry and it'll be very interesting to see not only how Nickelodeon handles it especially with the Kiss Choice Awards coming up I'm sure there's probably going to be protests there but also how Disney might be rushing to the Knicks you know we might have a Disney Channel documentary that comes out you know and so yeah I don't know man people are out here getting exposed left and right and you know I'm here for it I'm here for it I'm tired of horrible individuals doing horrible things to people to get to where they are all these people need to you know come off their high horse and need to be held accountable for what they put people through but those are my overall thoughts about this documentary please let me know all your thoughts about the documentary in the comments down below as i said earlier in the video let me know if this style of video still works for you all if you guys enjoy having the tiktoks throughout the video if you want me to just put tiktoks in the beginning of the video or if you guys want no tiktoks at all <laughs> let me know your thoughts in the comments down below if you guys enjoyed this video make sure you guys go ahead and give it a big thumbs up and don't forget to hit the subscribe button and i'll see you guys in the next video.